Hey, welcome back to Real Takes, where we are all movie love all the time with no spoilers and no plot recaps. I'm Ann Stott, and it is a new year. Happy 2022. Come on, 2022. Let's make it a happy one. But we are still in the time of Capricorn. And tonight we are celebrating Capricorn film director Dorothy Arzner. Who is Dorothy Arzner, you might ask? I'm so glad you did. Dorothy Arzner was the only woman to be a founding member of the Directors Guild of America, and she was the only woman to direct films within the Hollywood system in the 1930s and 1940s until Ida Lupino joined the Directors Guild of America in 1950 and began directing films. Dorothy Arzner worked across genre over uh, over a dozen, I think, 20 films. She worked with many great leading actresses, including Clara Bow, Catherine Hepburn, Maureen O'Hara, Rosalind Russell, Joan Crawford, Meryl Oberon, Lucille Ball. She is credited with inventing the boom mic. She directed one of Clarabeau's first talking films, and Clarabeau was very nervous about this new technology and how to work with it. And also the mic was in one stationary place, so it was getting some sound and not getting other sound famously played to comic effect, comic effect in the film Singing in the Rain. And so she suggested to the production team that they take the microphone tie it to a fishing pole and that a sound person stand with the fishing pole above their head oh so that the mic was over the shot line of the camera and could move with the actors inventing the boom mic now Dorothy Arzner started out in silent film, actually. She uh, started out as a typist in a script department at a production company that would become Paramount. And within just a few years, she was script writing and also editing. And she got her first directing job on a silent film by threatening to leave Paramount altogether and go to Columbia if they didn't let her direct. And I guess she was a valuable enough script writer and editor that they didn't want to lose her and they gave her a film to direct. I am, I know more about her talking films than I do about her silent films. She didn't direct that many silent films, just a few. And I'll be honest, her she's not a great visual auteur. Um, you're, you're not going to have, you know, some kind of unique cine cinematic experience watching her films, but she is an incredibly strong, confident storyteller. And I feel like when you watch her films, you can tell that she was originally a script writer and an editor because I just feel like whoever's making the film, Dorothy Arzner, understands how to move the story forward, how to move from scene to scene or shot to shot in a, in a really seamless way that, again, feels informed by her experience as an editor and as a script writer. Uh, like I said, she worked across genre and she had this um, great ability to work with leading actresses, apparently, even though she had a longtime partner um, she did more than just work with some of her leading actresses. Uh, but she gave Katherine Hepburn her first starring role. Katherine Hepburn had had, had had a bit part in another movie, but she was in her first starring role in a Dorothy Arzner film called Christopher Strong, where she plays an aviatrix loosely based on Amelia Earhart. It's a really strong role and basically sets the tone for Katherine Hepburn's persona in film for decades to come. And uh, she gave, she wasn't working with the best scripts of the day, but she gave them all an intelligence and humanity that elevated them beyond what they were. And the best ones were also written by women. And even though there were directors working in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s who really featured women and, you know, loved women and, and 
you know, there were these great, strong, leading ladies in the 30s and 40s in Hollywood um, who turned in incredible, one incredible performance after another. There's a way that um, in a Dorothy Arzner film, you know, the women aren't put on pedestals and they're not talked down to. There's like a, there's a space and a breathing room and a three dimensionality that the women are allowed to have that uh, I feels to me unusual for the time or particular to her style. Let's put it that way, particular to her style. And I want to talk about two movies in particular. I want to talk about a lesser known film of hers called Merrily We Go to Hell. Doesn't that sound fun? Aren't you excited? Um, starring Sylvia Sidney and Frederick March. And she, Dorothy Arzner has said that this is one of the, her favorite films of the films she made. And it's a really stark look at the effect of alcoholism on a marriage. Alcoholism and infidelity. Now this movie was made in what's called the pre-code period of Hollywood. So when talking pictures hit, in 1929, script writers and directors immediately started making movies about every aspect of life, including infidelity, sex, um, crime, you know, everything humans struggle with. And over the next five to eight years, some really um, deep, interesting filmmaking was done looking at all kinds of adult issues. And of course, the moral forces in our country rose up worrying that this was the beginning of, you know, the downfall of culture and the leading of the people into the ways of sin. And there was a big campaign to clean up film and it's a long story and many, many books have been written about it. The bottom line is that the major Hollywood studios all began participating in self-censorship because they wanted, they wanted the approval of this production code because they believed if their films didn't have the, the approval of this production code and the Catholic League, they wouldn't be shown in certain parts of the country and certain people wouldn't go to them and they would lose money. And that system was in place until the mid sixties. So this film is a pre-code film, which means that they could be honest about all kinds of issues that later they couldn't be honest about. So, um, Sylvia Sidney plays a, um, the daughter of a very wealthy businessman who falls in love with a working journalist who is an alcoholic and they get married and their love helps him stop drinking for a while. But you know, we know how that goes. And ultimately he starts drinking again and, um, has an affair. And even though there were, other dramas that involved alcohol and alcoholism in the thirties. I feel like this is a lens into how deteriorating alcoholism can be to intimate relationships that I haven't really seen from that era of filmmaking. And, you know, let's be honest, it's a 1930s film, so it's short and it, you know, it sort of ties things up in some, in, you know, some easy ways, but a lot of hard stuff happens and they go down, they go down. And I find it to be really, really moving and kind of brave, especially because it was made in 1933. I don't know if the word alcoholism was widely used then and Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in 1935. So, you know, the consciousness around what it was, was not there. And, and he is, judged and treated with a lot of moral reproach by people in his life. But, um, but because it's Dorothy Arzner, there's also a lot of humanity, 
um, given to both characters and the situations. Also, fun little tidbit, the movie features a young, not yet famous Cary Grant in a small supporting role. So that's Merrily We Go to Hell, which I hate to say is not streaming anywhere right now. So you have to keep an eye out for it. It comes around on TCM. It sometimes comes up on the Criterion channel. And then every once in a while, these things just pop up streaming on other services. So keep an eye out for it. It's worth the watch. But because it's not available anywhere, I'm also going to talk to you about Dorothy Arzner's most famous film, which is called Dance Girl Dance and stars Maureen O'Hara and Lucille Ball as the two leading members of a dance troupe that, you know, gets hired out to clubs and and sort of low-level Copacabana type places of the 30s. But um, Maureen O'Hara wants to be a serious dancer and Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball in an early role for her plays like the va va voom girl of the group who ultimately gets a job working in burlesque and then gets Maureen O'Hara a job as like the straight dancer to her, um, you know, sex act, basically. So again, pretty racy stuff um, for the time. And of course, there's a romance situation sort of weaved into all of this. But it's really enjoyable. Maureen O'Hara puts in a great turn in this role. And um, and there is a famous feminist takedown at the end of the movie that was so far ahead of its time. Honestly, I feel like I don't see women talking back to men in movies like this today. Or if I do, it's rare. It's a very satisfying moment, unlike anything in any other movie from the 1930s. So it's a great, fun rom-com, sort of working girls trying to make good sort of movie. And it also has these touches that you just haven't seen before in 1930s film. So highly recommend Dance Girl Dance, which is available to watch. So, uh, Dorothy Arzner worked in, worked in the Hollywood system. Okay, I just have to um, jump in here quickly because I'm in danger of doing a certain kind of regressive, closety thing that I really hate uh, and I didn't intend to do at all, which is I'm showing you these pictures of Dorothy Arzner, who was clearly gender non-conforming, definitely queer, gay, um, and lived her life completely out and like not referencing it at all. And in fact, she's been treated that way by historians too. There's this documentary about her that was made in the 80s, um, which is great that they made a documentary about her and her work in the 80s, but they reference that she lived with her partner, Marion Morgan, the choreographer, for 40 years they lived together. And the 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 um, backflips that these documentarians go through to kind of justify this partnership, talking about how it healed her wound with her mother. And like, no, they were lovers. They were partners. They lived together. So I don't want to be that person. Dorothy Arzner was a trailblazer on this level too. As I said, she was completely out in her life at a time when in Hollywood, no one was out, including other directors like well, George Cukor was pretty out, but there were a lot of people, you know, living the open secret life. And she did not live the open secret life. She was open. And she wore suits to set. Um, so just another level on which she was a total trailblazer and courageous and had so much integrity. So all respect to Dorothy Arzner. Um, just being very clear about uh, her life and how um, how righteous she was. Okay, back to the regular video. In the Hollywood system through the mid 40s and then she got sick with pneumonia and she was in bed for a year with pneumonia. And as she got better, she just felt like 
she didn't see a place for herself in Hollywood with the films that were being made. And she was independently wealthy. And she said that was a, you know, that that affected her career because she could turn down scripts she didn't want to make. So she wasn't forced to make things that didn't feel right to her, which is interesting. Um, and she started teaching. And by the early 60s, she was teaching at the UCLA Film School. And in particular, uh, Francis Ford Coppola was a young student of hers. And there's a great interview with him where he talks about her influence on him and what he learned from her. And she, apparently she gave him encouragement in some really low moments in his development as a filmmaker. But he said he learned something from her that he used his whole career, which is she said that actors are acting for you, the director. And so you should never sit behind a camera far away from them. Dorothy Arzner always crouched beneath the camera watching the actors so they could feel her right there with them. And she told him that if right as you call cut, you look up to the cinematographer, you can tell by their expression whether or not you got the take. And he said that's how he's always directed. He sits by the camera and he's, I mean, I don't know how that worked on Apocalypse Now in major action scenes with helicopters and people hundreds of yards away, but I'm assuming for his dramas and his the situations where people were close to him, um, he sat right next to the camera and made sure that the actors knew he was there for them. And he learned that from Dorothy Orsner. So um, her influence on film has a long, basically a century long reach through the people she taught and um, her, her um, courage. And I mean, I have to assume tenacity being the only woman directing film in Hollywood uh, produced some really uh, moving, strong work from lots of great actresses. And I highly recommend you check her out. I'll put some of the other, um, some of the other films I know in the comments with where they're uh, streamable. Craig's Wife is a great Rosalind Russell picture, said to be one of Rosalind Russell's favorite pictures of hers that she made. Uh, the Bride Wore Red. Um, oh, now it's escaping me. There's another one I like. Oh, I'll put it in the comments. Anyway, happy birthday, Dorothy Arzner. Thank you for your strength, your tenacity, your talent, your gifts, your films, and I will see you all next Wednesday. Thanks for watching Real Takes. Hit the subscribe button below so the algorithms will tell you when new episodes are out. And if you want to support Real Takes, please visit my Patreon page where you can join at any tier from $2 to $100 per thing I make. The $15 tier is specifically about supporting Real Takes and you'll get behind the scenes information and be thanked in future videos. See you next Wednesday.